Do you have days when your feet hurt? Maybe they even burn? Perhaps you have pain in your arch or numbness in the toes. All these are signals that are telling you about the body and your feet, and your feet are the antenna. My journey in the wellness industry was when I lost the ability to walk and had to rebuild my feet as well as the rest of my body because of the excruciating pain that I was experiencing in my feet. I had to find a new way to engage as a dancer, but also to engage with my dancers that I was teaching, as well as how I was doing things in my life and my dance career. This is one of the greatest gifts to my learning. So I do give thanks to my feet for all their wisdom. So what are you doing to change the way your feet can feel and heal? How have you been listening to those aches and pains? And our guest today is Dr. Margaret Winters, who is a functional medical practitioner and upper cervical chiropractor practicing in Tucson, Maryland in the USA. I'm hoping I got that right. She came to healthcare after a career in multimedia-based medical education and her personal experiences with chronic fatigue and a debilitating immune system have formed the bedrock of her work with patients, which almost always starts with gut health. One of the quotes I just wanted to bring forward that she shared with me is, I'm passionate about removing barriers to living a full and happy life. Working together, we can rebuild the health, normal patterns that are your birthright. Creating whole body health enables you to enjoy exuberant vitality at your age and any stage of life. So you're listening to Be Well with Michelle Greenwell. This is season two, episode six, Feet and Your Health with Dr. Margaret Winters. Hello, Margaret. Hi, Michelle. It's such a treat to be with you. And thank you for inviting me. Oh, my pleasure. It's been lovely to get to know you um, in some of the different projects we've been working on. And of course, when you find someone else who's interested in feet, <laughs> it's a lovely conversation to be able to engage in. So I like to start my sessions always with a cup of tea. And that's because I'm, well, I'm passionate about tea, but also I like to just give a little bit of information about our tea company called Tea with Intention, where we use intention infused within the herbs and the tea and just to shed a little light on that. Do you have something in your mug today? I do. I am drinking a black tea. It's uh, a little bit before four o'clock in the afternoon here on the East Coast of the US, and it's it's a nice time for a cuppa. So I have a black tea, it's a Kuzmi tea, um, and it is, I love that word, infused with uh, citrus and uh, various forms of citrus. It's called uh, bouquet aux fleurs, and it's just a nice basic black tea. Beautiful. And do you have a special mug? Is there one that you typically use? This is just a plain white mug that is a large, it's a large mug that it's very, it feels really nice when you hold it in both hands. So it mm -hmm. makes a good stout cup, whether you're making herbal or green or black tea. And it's the one remaining cup of a uh, disaster in the bathroom down the hall where all the existing cups got broken except this one. So it's the survivor <laughs> cup. <laughs> I love that. I love it. So even as you say it was plain white, you already were hugging it and it was, you can tell, like everybody has this, this um, the cups or the mugs or the whatever, they do have meaning. And I'm just always fascinated by what people choose. Thank you for sharing that. So well, I'm- Thanks for asking. I chose Liberty Wine today, and it was because actually of the intention that's on the package, because I was looking for the, the right piece. And so on the package, it says, the challenges of my past are released easily and joyfully with each sip. And I was thinking about the, the journey I've had with my feet and just rebuilding the body and letting go of all the emotions that pocketed into my feet. And so that phrase kind of resonated with me. And then I put it with my mug that comes from Prince Edward Island. So this is the other island. I live on Cape Breton Island. Um, but in, for those that can see this, I know those on the podcast won't be able to, but there's like a, um, I, the, the painting is done in the shape of a beach scene, but the artist took all the sand off the beach and put it into each of the colors. 
So I always feel like I'm kind of touching the sand when I do that. And one of my favorite things in the summertime is to have to move my feet in the sand. So I was trying to link those two together. So a cheers to you. Thank you for joining the podcast. And back at you. See where we're, our conversation is going to go. I love that idea of feet in the sand. It is, it is for lots of us who grow up on the coast, one of our first truly extraordinary, extraordinary tactile experiences of all this the stimulation that we get from our feet. Um, because alas, most of us start our lives with shoes on, you know, we're, we're put in shoes and we're, we're kept in shoes. So there's not enough time of playing with our tootsies when we're little kids. <laughs> exactly. I was in um, Costa Rica and wore the wrong shoes to go on what I didn't know was going to be a hike. There, we all had the wrong shoes on. I was wearing flip-flops. <laughs> we were going, they said we were going a hundred meters, but they didn't say down a cliff, up a cliff over the other side. <laughs> so anyway, so when we got to where we were going and we swam in this lovely lagoon and waterfall and everything, then we had to walk back <laughs> and back up. And the flip-flops. And my feet were too wet. So we looked at each other, uh, several of us with the flip-flops, and we just took them off. And then we walked in the in the jungle with just our feet just on the leaves. It was so spectacular. Coming wow. from Canada, where if you stepped, it would be onto pine needles and it would be very sharp. But there it was just so soft. But again, that brings that whole piece of the feet up and that how much they tell us when we're listening. Right. Or when we allow them to work the way they are intended to. Mm -hmm. um, just a note about flip-flops from the point of view of the function of the feet. I mean, flip-flops are great at the beach, in the shower, but if you walk around with them, and I've had many conversations with my patients about this, the toes are always gripping. So that sets up the whole kinetic chain in a really kind of unfortunate way, it doesn't let the food, the foot glide through its motion from heel strike, through flow through, through toe off, because the the, the feet are the, the the forefoot is always under tension, gripping on to the sole of the shoe and that um, rubber shank between the first two toes. So, I've spent many a year in flip-flops, but I actually don't wear flip-flops much at all anymore. And I try to convince my patients that they're really not great shoes for any extended period of time. So I'm sorry to rain on your flip-flops, but that's, that's the truth. <laughs> well, and you should never wear them on a hiking trip. That's for sure. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Dashing to the mailbox, maybe, but that's. Exactly. Exactly. Walking on leaves sounds pretty, pretty fun. Yeah, it was it was lovely. Um, in your chiropractic work, you actually you spend a lot of time in the upper cervical part, so you're working in shoulders and neck. So I'm just curious how you ended up with the specialty going to the feet. So I'm I'm going to tell you a little bit of background about upper cervical work. Um, I came to chiropractic school in recovery from chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, I was I was kind of a wreck and I it was time to get out of my corporate career and do something else. And one of the things that had been really helpful to me as a, a person was chiropractic care. And I liked the fact that it was practical. Um, I liked the fact that it was in that middle space between traditional allopathic medicine and um, a realm that is more um, less scientifically, uh, has less scientific um, obvious connections. Let me put it that way. Because because I think chiropractors live and functional medicine practitioners also live in the middle of, they're kind of at the fulcrum. You know, we can, we can talk to either group because we have a foot in both areas. And that for me is a very balanced and helpful place. So I started chiropractic school, and one of the things that happened pretty quickly was that I was exposed to upper cervical care, and that's really focused on the join between the skull and the cervical spine. So the very top verte um, vertebra is called the atlas because it's carrying the weight of the world on its shoulders. Right? 
So the technique I practice is called at atlas orthogonal, which is a ridiculous term, but basically orthogonal just means everything's at right angles. So we want we want the, the plane line, the horizontal plane line of that atlas to be level with the ground, level with the horizon, and everything to be as centered and upright as it can be in terms of the alignment of the, of the skull on top of that plane line and then the cervical spine below. So we're nice, simple, non-stressful, freely moving joint between the skull and the rest of the spine is really important because all the spinal tracts that descend from the skull, from the, from the brain, have to pass through that vertebra. So it's an incredible bottleneck. If it's not right, all sorts of things go wrong. It's almost always implicated in migraines, TMJ, uh, uh, trigeminal neuralgia, lots and lots of conditions. And it's almost always affected by fender benders, falls, you name it. But here's the thing. Minor misalignment there can also be a bottleneck in, in terms of just putting a, a little bit of a break on the whole, the whole system downstream, okay? Um, so if you, if you don't have free circulation around that area of cerebrospinal fluid, um, um, free flow of, of neuro, nervous system energy information, um, two tissues and back up to the brain, things don't work as well. So when, when I first got my atlas adjusted properly, it changed my world. So that became my technique of specialty. I was trained in other techniques and in full body adjusting, and I still do that. But I started from the get-go with that focus on, let's make sure that's right, and let's do everything to make sure that that's supported and is easy to, for the body to maintain. So I had a patient in student clinic who was this short, charming, hardworking woman. She worked in a factory. She, she came in because she had terrible low back pain and, and somebody had told her, okay, these, 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 these young weirdos who do this technique at the chiropractic college actually have a really good track record with low back pain, which we do. So she came in and um, her low back was in terrible shape. We got her atlas adjusted. Things got better. I mean, obviously I was adjusting her low back as well, but I noticed that she would come in and she would be almost almost in tears tired, which I really related to with my experience with chronic fatigue. And it turned out that the job that she had, she was on her feet all the time. It, it was just, it really changed my world in multiple ways because that's when I realized that a lot of people, especially women in the workplace, are at the mercy of really unkind working conditions and it comes at a really high cost for their bodies and their spirits. And this is certainly true for this woman. So I looked at her shoes and I, we talked about, you know, her working conditions. And because I was not allowed to prescribe orthotics for her, because that was outside of my scope as a student chiropractor, I sent her to a local chiro chiropractor who was able to do that. And that made a big difference for her. So we we taken a great leap forward with getting her atlas adjusted. We've taken a great leap forward with getting her low back adjusted. And obviously I'd given her stretches and stuff to do. But then when we put her in orthotics that supported her feet, which were in pretty poor shape, things got significantly better again. So that really told me that if the the basis of the body's contact with the earth is working well, and the pelvis is balanced, and the upper the upper thoracic area where the back meets the, the lower neck is stable, the body has a much easier time carrying this head around. And the head, it's a big object, right? It weighs a lot. It's basically like a bowling ball on top of a slinky, okay? Which is really a problem when you're in a car accident because it goes wah, 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 and destabilizes the ligaments that holds everything together. So everything we can do from the ground up to make that job easier is a huge win. So that's how I got started with feet. And the journey kind of evolved from there. So like many chiropractors, I was, I was exposed to using um, orthotics because of pronation. And after a while, I realized this is not the whole story with feet. This is helpful, but it's not really a panacea. And, and, what we were all doing, and podiatrists do this too, is we'll put a patient 
in orthotics. And that's that, we never go back and revisit it. And along the way, it started to dawn on me that not all, number one, not all, all orthotics are created equal. And number two, even beyond that, how is it that a structure that's been carrying mankind and womankind around for millennia suddenly has to have this specific support that never changes in a shoe for perpetuity? Why don't we look at how the foot works and see if we can strengthen it and give it, give it better circumstances to operate? So that opened my mind a little bit to other people who are really far more advanced with feet than I am and natural movement than I am. You know, I'm a, I'm kind of a translator. I'm, I'm sort of in a nexus place. So, <laughs> um, you know, I'm always looking at stuff and then re repurposing, repackaging it in, in little bites for my patients and people that I work with. So I started to get exposed to the world of functional feet functional movement, functional medicine, it all kind of came together at the same time. So, and I had to make my own journey with my own feet because, you know, as a teenager, I wore platform soles that were, I mean, I can still remember a couple of really ridiculous pairs. And, you know, I have had my share of ankle sprains in things like dance goes, which I would not dream of wearing now. Um, but because of my corporate career, I wore shoes that looked great and weren't great to walk in. And so my last pair of shoes like that died a, a, a sorry death the day that I turned my ankle, you know, carrying a chair. And that was that. And since then I've I've been in very slight heels or no heels. And it's a transition. I don't recommend people just jump from a heel shoe into a flat shoe because you need to be doing some gradual transition and work on your feet. But the other thing that I realized about heels in particular, speaking about shoes, number one, women are very ill served in the shoe department. We've <laughs> we'll got you're looking shoes that are very badly put together and don't let the foot, foot move well. Men's shoes for in terms of quality are, are they get a whole lot better quality for the money. And unless they're in a kind of Italian style, very narrow toe box shoe, generally speaking, their feet have better, they're better supported. They have more room. They just, they get, it's, it's the same thing with little kids clothes. If you look at little boys clothes, they're sturdier, they're more functional, they cost less. And little girls get purple and pink and it's not, it's not good quality and it doesn't last, but it's, and it's very um, gender determinative. Okay, sorry, I can digress all, all day long. <laughs> but coming back around to, to shoes, the thing that I realized as a chiropractor is that a heel basically shortens the back line of the body and it, it causes the pelvis to kind of jam forward. It's almost like you're sticking your butt out when you're, when you're wearing a pair of heels. It just it happens naturally. And that jams the low back so a lot of people who are wearing heels are really setting themselves up for low back problems going forward. And when the low back and the pelvis don't move well, you're most likely going to have knee problems as well. Because, you know, the knee is just the dumb guy in the middle, right? <laughs> it's a hand. That's all it does is flop, flop, you know, back and forth. Fear factor. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So unless it gets hit, like clipped in a football game or something like that, Direct trauma to the knee is, is going to cause knee problems, but most knee problems are actually coming from either the foot or the hip and pelvic area or both. Right? So if you're wearing heels, you're really making everything not work well. Plus, the other thing that happens is that when you jam the sacrum up into the low back, then what also happens is that the head goes forward from the shoulders. And that is the source of a lot of women you'll see um, in their 60s and 70s who've got that terrible kyphosis and that head sticking forward, which is really painful to see. They used to call it a dowager's hump. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And all of this is really avoidable. And it starts with the feet. So if we can get the feet moving 
better and better supported in a shoe that has a wide toe box and allows the foot to move normally in that heel strike flow through toe off, then things are better everywhere. It's a global effect. The other thing that tight toe boxes do, especially for women's shoes, is that they squeeze the toes. It's like wearing a rubber band around your toes. And not only is that unkind and uncomfortable, but it also means that the big toe in particular can't dorsiflex, i.e. flex upward toward the knee. And that's, that's a rigid lever that lets you propel forward in your, in your gait cycle. So heel strike, flow through, and then toe off. That big toe joint has to move up and down. And if it's not able to do that, then we have trouble upstream. So feet are really important. <laughs> and one of the best ways to strengthen your feet is number one, get out of your shoes. Go walk on the beach. Run on the beach if you're a runner. The other thing that's really important about that is we have incredible sensory input to the whole system from the feet, as you, exactly as you were describing from walking on those leaves. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I have patients do, and this is in one of the, the uh, YouTube clips that we talked about, is um, I'll have them take a nail brush. First of all, I'll have them stand on their tippy toes, right? Just to check in on how everything feels, how stable they are, you know, just Pay attention to what it's like to be in a dorsiflex position on your tippy toes and how well you can balance from there. It's surprising. Most of us don't spend any time paying attention to our feet. So then I'll have them take one foot and a little nail brush and just rub all over the bottom of the foot, the sides of the foot, top of the foot, in between the toes. Just get a lot of sensory input in there yeah. and go back up and try that tippy toe test again. It's astounding. It's astounding what happens. You're like, wow, that's way more stable. It feels alive. Mm -hmm. So as a dancer, you, I'm sure you're very familiar with this, that sensory input drives motor output. And, and um, coming from foot percussion um, with, between highland step dance and tap dancing, <laughs> um, yeah. my heels shut off because I was hitting the heels always in, you know, uh, different kinds of rhythmic patterning. And so the sensors just got tired of telling me what was going on to it. They just stopped functioning. And it took quite a while for me to um, raise the awareness. I could have used a brush. I was using my hands, but just to mm -hmm. rub that heel until I could finally sense the bottom of my heel. It was really interesting that I could only sense it through my fingertips. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Secondhand information. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I would suspect too that your heel bone, your calcaneus, probably was jammed, and that wouldn't help it uh, at all. Mm -hmm. Because it, it, you're absolutely right when when we keep using up system resources, saying something's not right, something's not right, something's not right. It, it has a it causes a functional deficit, but it's also system noise. It's like static. If you're listening to the radio as you're as you're traveling, you'll get a, as you move further away from the from the source of the signal, you'll get some static and then you, you retune to a closer station where you get a better signal. That's what that kind of aberrant, you know, messaging that's saying from a joint to the whole system, something is not really right here. If you start to think about that on a global level, the body's always communicating system to system. We, we talk about systems like the immune system, the digestive system, the lymphatic system, one of my real favorites, um, <laughs> cardiovascular, but no system works alone. I'm quoting Perry Nicholson right now, who's one of my mentors and I'm really smart about the lymphatic system. Uh, no system works alone. No system gets damaged alone or hurt alone and no system heals alone. Exactly, yeah. So when we're so, targeting particular spots and thinking, well, if I just fix where the pain point is, it's, it's not the pain point. That's just the symptom spot. It's the right. everywhere else that you need to look at. Exactly. And it's not that symptoms don't have a story to tell. I mean, I, I pay attention to symptoms if only symptoms are indicative of what's going on. 
So you want to take them seriously, but you also want to take them with a grain of salt because they, they're not the whole story. But anybody who has practiced with people knows that you damn well better pay attention to symptoms because otherwise you're being very rude to your patient, right? <laughs> yeah. They're coming in with a problem that's expressed as a symptom. Yeah, exactly. So, so it's only fair to talk about that. It's just that's not right. the whole story. Exactly, exactly, right. Um, so when you have a patient come in, what, what do you typically start with then in a conversation as, that leads you to feet? Because I know there's lots of things they can come in for, but what is the typical patterning that kind of leads you to the feet and looking at them? Um, in an ideal world, I would always make sure that I always talk to everybody about feet and I would always talk to everybody about the junction of the upper back and the lower neck and the skull and the upper uh, upper neck. And I would give them movement work. In reality, it's easier to get to the feet faster when they have a lower back issue, right? mm -hmm. pelvic issue, something like that, because that's a very direct connection for people. So it makes total sense to them. It's not, it's not an, it's, there's no real education required to get from the low back to the feet. It, it may be a little bit of an, oh, really? Oh, yeah, okay, that makes sense. It's a little bit more of a translation to think that something going on in the upper part of the body, especially the head and neck, might be related to the feet. So I might take a little bit longer to get to the feet, but I do try to always get there because, you know, when the dogs are barking, nothing's good. Yeah. It's... It's kind of like the gut. When the gut's in trouble, it's like when mom is not happy, ain't nobody happy. And when the feet aren't happy, ain't nobody upstream going to be working all that well. So <laughs> you're not walking very far. <laughs> yeah. And and I'll look at their shoes when they come in for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and if they're if they're wearing unfortunate shoes, we will have that conversation. Mm -hmm. I try yeah. to give people things that they can use for their own self-care. So um, foot rubs is a really nice little tool that, that will wake up the feet in a hurry. And, um, you know, there are, other, there are other small inexpensive tools that I like to, to, to educate people on so that they can use that on a routine basis um, and not have to come tearing into the chiropractor every two weeks. You know, I, I, I don't want to, I love you, but I don't want to see you that often. I want to get you better and see you occasionally. Yeah. Yeah. So what, uh, so you mentioned the foot rub then. So what would you do with that? Um, I stole a really nice uh, sequence from, um, oh gosh, what's Jill's last name? It's escaping me now. Harry Starrett and uh, Jill Miller did a book oh. together. If you just say um, that again, your voice faded there for a moment. Okay. So Jill Miller is somebody I know through the, the world of fascia, okay? And she has uh, a company that's called Yoga Tuna. Um, and well, she you have to say it again. You faded again. Okay. Sorry. Let me scoot closer to my mic. How's that? Better? Yeah. Thank you. So Jill Miller's company is called Yoga Tune Up. She's got a very interesting, it's worth getting on her list. Um, for emails. Uh, and she, with Ke Kelly Starrett, who's a uh, doctor of physical therapy and a super smart guy who works a lot in the world of runners and athletes, um, did a book together. Um, and I learned this little sequence about uh, energizing the feet, um, which they call foot flossing. And I've stolen the term because it it's I love that because it says you really should be doing something for your feet every day, just like flossing your, your, your teeth, floss your feet. So it's a sequence that activates the, the base of the heel, the sides of the heel, the underside of the dome of the foot, and then gets you working on squeezing the ball and lifting and spreading your toes, mm -hmm. which is incredibly important. Um, and another tool I like a lot is from Naboso. And it's uh, 
what they call toe splay. Now, Correct Toes makes a, a version of this, but I like the toe splay because it's so much more comfortable to wear. And basically that spreads the toes apart. And when you think about most shoes that are like wearing a harsh rubber band around your toes, being able to spread those toes, that's a solution for a lot of people who have bunions starting to get movement back into the foot. Mm -hmm. So those are tools I like a lot. Excellent. Okay. And um, what do you find the most surprising connection with the feet that you see in your practice? So I know you talked about the neck and the back, pelvis, and coming through, but I know there's some other areas too. Like you said, sometimes it takes you a while to get down to the foot just because people don't make that relationship. But is there something that you found that was an interesting discovery um, that just linked back? Well, there are two things really. One is um, general happiness. When mm -hmm. people's feet are not stressed, they feel better, they have more energy, they move better, everything gets better. Lots of people don't actually notice it so much, but they just feel livelier. And that is gold to me. Mm -hmm. Simple lifestyle change. Now, no, no lifestyle change is really simple. I mean, it may be simple, but it's not easy. Um, and it's, I'm going to be working on my feet for the next decade, probably. You know, I, I have plenty of dysfunction with my own feet to keep working on, but I've made a lot of progress. The thing about working with feet is it can be slow, right? Because we've had decades and decades and decades and decades in a certain pattern. But once you start to shift it, other things shift that are really not even, they don't feel like they're directly related to the feet at all. So general energy, general happiness, general vitality, certainly not to be despised. The other thing that's really interesting to me is that, and this is more my speculation than I'm able to prove, but I honestly think that the gut works better, the brain works better, everything works internally in terms of visceral or organic function, you know, in the realm of functional medicine is improved by feet working better. So I think functional movement and functional, you know, internal function, physiological function are linked in ways that people don't think about. So that was really, it was, you know, all my moments of enlightenment are kind of like, duh. You know? <laughs> Once the penny dropped in the slot, I thought, oh, of course, of course that makes total sense. But until the penny's in the slot, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't make that connection. Mm -hmm. And I'll, and and the brain and the feet are connected in really interesting ways. And I'd like to walk you through a little exercise that that really demonstrates that. Perfect. Sounds good. So you want to you want to have your your doesn't matter whether it's your right foot or your left foot. Um, but start making a clockwise circle with your foot. So the foot's on the floor, and you just no. Yeah. Drawing no, a circle you, you with want it on free, the floor. You want it, you want it, you want it free moving. You mm -hmm. want it free moving. So you can you can cross your legs, you know, cross your right leg over your left leg so that it's dangling, and then mm -hmm. just circle it across, you know, in a clockwise direction. Mm -hmm. Okay. So just pay attention to that. Okay. And then you're going to take the same hand, like your right hand, and draw the letter six. Letter with six. Your finger in the, yeah. And watch what happens to your foot. Goes in the opposite direction. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It matches. It, it can't maintain going clockwise when you are doing a counterclockwise movement with your hand. Which I, I just find that fascinating. It's a great party trick, but it's fascinating because it's, it's saying something about how the body's wired. Mm -hmm. So your conscious intention about where you want your body to go and be overridden by hardwiring that we don't have any control over. And so if you start to see that, then it really makes you think in a very different way about how am I living my life? What am I doing or asking my body to do that is really counterproductive to my happiness, my productivity, you know, my, my, my 
relationships, my health, my, you know, my capacity for joy, all of those things. And feet have a role to play with us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you as a dancer, I'm sure this makes sense to you, but for a lot of people that I run across, it's not. They're just things they walk on. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't, right. it doesn't have that same joy. Yeah. Yeah. That, that and like experience. other parts of the body, the real object for most people is their, their, their physical being is they just don't want to be bothered. They just want everything to work, nothing to hurt. Just do your job and let me think about my to-do list or, you know, that thing on in the store window that I want to go buy. Whatever. Yeah. Just do your job and don't complain. Yeah. And don't complain. And, you know, uh, there was a yeah. dance. One of the dance teachers, I didn't train with her. Um, she trained the teacher that I had when I was young. And um, I met her many years later at a dance competition. And one of the things that she said was she never missed a day pampering her feet at the end of the day. Never right. missed a day. And I was like, wow, who has that kind of time was my first thought. Because <laughs> right? at the end of the day, so I just wanted to put my feet up. And I was just like, you know, collapsed on the couch from, you know, all the things I had done. But she made it a definite point that that was how, and she always finished with a bath and then they were pampered and then she carried on with what she was doing. Yeah. Well, Last bravo time. her. I'll tell you, there's a lot faster way to give your feet a little bit of love. Um, um, and it's, it's very simple. I, I don't do it at the end of the day. This is something I give to patients and I do after a shower like, or a bath. Get out of the bath and you're going to put lotion on your body most likely. So what I have people do is rub lotion all over their feet and then interlace their fingers through their toes, across your ankle, over your knee, and hold on to the, the top of your foot and slide your fingers in between your toes and then do a slow... I used to call it a circle. It's really an oval about five times in one direction and five times in the other. More is better, but five is very doable. And you'll be amazed how good that feels and how good it is for your feet. And if you do that tippy toe test again before and after, you'll be surprised by what a difference just a, a less than one minute exercise for your feet can, can make. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Most people are not going to do it at the end of the day because they've been in socks and their feet are stinky. And they're just like, oh, <laughs> well, touch that. and then everybody goes, I don't want to touch the feet. Don't want well, it's like, yeah, but they're like so important, you know? And if, if you yep. give them, you know, and, and my dancers, we would be rubbing the feet before putting the shoes on. I would forget that we rubbed the feet and my hands had held my feet. That was not even important anymore. We just carried on with dancing. We're not going right. to put our fingers in our mouth while we're dancing. So it's not like we have to worry about anything. <laughs> <laughs> but uh well i will i will say with with fingers and this is just a mild rant about um the immune system really one of my concerns with this post-covid world is that so many people have gotten addicted to hand sanitizer and most hand sanitizer is quite the chemical cocktail mm -hmm. um i was very fortunate when covid hit because i had because of cleaning equipment i had a lot of alcohol in my office not the kind that you drink but the kind that you use to clean stuff. And so I just made, I just made hand sanitizer with, you know, 70% alcohol and a little bit of glycerin or aloe vera and some lavender or whatever. And that's all hand sanitizer needs to be. But here's the thing. If you're always obsessively cleaning your hand, and this is especially true for children, we're supposed to be breathing in the world. We're supposed to be touching and being exposed to all sorts of different microbes. Now, I'm not talking about sliding your hands into slimy goop. That's clearly not a good idea. But we don't have to obsessively clean every surface that we touch, including our hands. It's just, mm -hmm. it's not necessary and it's actually not really wise. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Rub the feet, carry on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So let's talk about one of the, this is a, a, a favorite piece for me is, is plantar fasciitis <laughs> because so many people suffer from it and, yep. and it's, well, I'm not going to say it's an easy fix, but 
There is a way to fix it that doesn't take a long time. And so what is your experience with people with plantar fasciitis? Okay, so it's very painful. It's very limit, life limiting, and that's a, just a real tragedy. And so mm -hmm. I am, I am. And remember that although we didn't really talk about this, one of the diversions or side lines that I have investigated in my life as a chiropractor has been the world of fascia, and I follow. Um, uh, there's a group of, there's a practice in Italy uh, that's a family called the Steccos, S-T-E-C-C-O. And Love their analysis, wow. Oh, okay. So you know about this. I do, Wait. but the audience needs to know about them. Yes. So yes. What, what they're really looking at is where are the sticking points where fascia gets stuck so that it can't move properly forward, back, bending side to side, or twisting. So when when fascia, which is the three dimensional web that that we all that's basically our internal structure, and carries veins, arteries, nerves, lymphatic vessels, where you know wraps around muscle and tendon and ligament. I mean, fascia is everywhere. Okay. So when fascia doesn't glide well, when it doesn't move well, the whole body starts to have problems moving. And movement is life. You know, once we stop moving, we die. So, so the stuccos really looked at where are the points around the body, joint by joint, where things tend to get stuck and how do you release them? So it's a manual method, which I try not to do because I find it very tiring, but it really helps you think about what's going on with the body. So the first thing that I tend to think about when somebody comes in and they have a you know, plantar fasciitis situation is what's going on upstream, right? We can talk about where that plantar fascia attaches to the, the heel bone, fine, and look at what's going on with the Achilles tendon in the back, but it's never just a foot problem. So that's my first starting place with that. The other is that it's probably a weak foot that needs to be strengthened, and it's a foot that has been in shoes that are not helping it much. And so we need to start moving um, away from, from the kind of shoes that you've been wearing into something that's going to help your foot move and function better. But the problem is it's a long and slow process. And most people are just going to say, oh my God, give me a shot, put, put some orthotics in. I, I can't, I just can't. So tell me what you do, because I think that you probably have a whole different approach than I do. And I'd love to hear about it. Well, I'm fascinated by your conversation about the fascia, um, because I didn't think about what I do in terms of the fascia, but it is, it's definitely a lovely way to connect it. But you're right in that, you know, the focus always goes to the foot and always goes to the pain point. And it is excruciating um, when you, you just can't even walk on your feet. But the thing is to-, to And where look, else are you gonna walk? You know, <laughs> and to look further upstream, um, to look at what is happening with, the fascia that's running through the leg, what's happening with, um, and particularly from my experience, the when hormones start to go a little bit wacky, then you have all these lower leg things that go on. And then it shows up in the feet because the, the leg is so tight. And as you were talking about high-heeled shoes, if you accentuate tight legs and high-heeled shoes, then you just keep holding and holding and holding and locking. Um, so it's it's um, it's such a journey to find where is that that place amongst the fascia that you can actually release and let go. Um, yep. So I, I love your connection of what you've put there. I think the other thing to think about, um, and I love the way you're connecting the dots with hormones because, you know, no system gets damaged alone, no system heals alone. So one of the things that is a problem with tight tissue or stressed tissue is that it doesn't accept fluid well, right? Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't accept fluid well, that means it's not getting good circulation. It's not getting good fresh oxygenated blood and it's not getting good lymphatic drainage. That's the sanitation, clean, clean up the cellular trash system, right? So 
it, that that means you're not getting enough in there and you're not getting enough out of there, which means you know stagnation. Stagnation is always a breeding ground for dysfunction and disease and inflammation. Now, a word about inflammation because it's important to think about this in a in a bigger perspective than we we currently do. We're all we've all been talking about inflammation like it's a problem. We've got to reduce inflammation. And in fact, that is true. Inflamed tissue is painful. And in the case of plantar fasciitis, that's really a problem because because the pain prevents movement and movement is part of the the, the road out of pain. So that's a nasty conundrum to be stuck in. Um, but inflammation is in its early stages, the body's way of protective healing, right? It's that prostaglandin cascade starts to actually get macrophages in there, eating up, you know, invaders, bacteria, whatever, you know, whatever needs to be cleaned up. That's inflammation's part of that. Fever is a point. Uh, form of inflammation and that you know hot environments critter you know nasty critters don't don't thrive mostly mm -hmm. i spent a lot of time in the infrared sauna during covid right? <laughs> you know heat 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 is uh our friend in a lot of cases now of course with children you got to be careful and no fever going on for a long time or too high is good but so the problem with most inflammation is not that in itself it's bad. It's just that it doesn't resolve. And the analog to that is stress. We are under constant stress, constant cortisol barrage of, you know, sympathetic overload, load, fight, flight, freak out, freeze. Oh my God. And it goes on and on and on and on. So we never get to decompress. And so the parasympathetic, the rest and digest system doesn't ever work properly. And that is a big input into gut dysfunction and crappy relationships, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I know this is a long way from plantar fasciitis, but... <laughs> but it's not, it's right? It's, right? It's not because, you know, you end up with that tension. The tension's held there a lot. Your feet tell you, you have they have this incredible pain and you go, I just need to fix my feet. And it's like, yeah, you could fix your feet. But then it's going to just show up somewhere else because you really didn't look at what was going on and how can you, how can you look at the whole system and how to how do you bring that function in and and you know are you holding things tightly in the leg are you wearing the shoes that aren't going to support you are you standing on cement all day like that makes a big deal and so yes you could put an orthotic on but if you're still standing on that cement in a really bad shoe <laughs> you know. And you haven't changed anything about the tension in your body. You only moved one tiny little piece. And so, you know, for people to really be ready to look at things and instead of saying, fix it with that one fix, saying, hey, how do I get my system back into this incredible flow that everything wants to be happy? Because just when you said, you know, happiness is a surprise piece and it's like, yeah. So if you find that happiness through the whole system, what do you create? Happy, happy feet make happier people. You know, it's, a, it's amazing. Yeah. And that is really the problem with pain. Yeah. It's very difficult for people in pain to filter that out and be enjoy their lives and enjoy their relationships. Um, and that's why, you know, going back to what I said earlier about symptoms, you have to, at a certain level, be very aware of people's symptoms because when pain is one of them, and it's usually the tip of the iceberg, it's the first one that, it's the last one to show up, first one to go away. So people tend to equate absence of pain with all is well. <laughs> and it's yep. not, you know, here's, pain is a signal that you are about to fall off the cliff, right? You Like, this is an emergency. Absence of pain doesn't mean that you're not within six feet of toppling off the cliff, where you really want to be a good solid half mile away from the cliff. That's where you want to be. So exactly. pain's not a very good in, in, indicator, but it is very difficult, difficult for people to, 
do anything but be obsessed with your pain when they are in pain, especially if it's that kind of pervasive, acute mm -hmm. pain that causes shutdown in other areas. Mm -hmm. As of course, with your history, you're very, very aware. And it's, it's cyclical too, because, um, you learn so much, right? So you, you remove the pain, you carry on, you made some adjustments and then it comes around again because you have some patterns that didn't get changed. They were adjusted, but and maybe you went back to your old habits because that's possible, but maybe you didn't, maybe you made some strides and you started to bring in some healthier choices and things that really were supporting your vitality. But then there's another story that wants to come out. And that next story, for me, it kept coming out my feet because that was the most important part of my body for where I would listen. Um, I wasn't going to yeah. listen if it was my arm. I could get away with dancing with one arm, you know. So, no, it's got to come out of the feet. So, But then that story just comes around. But it's nice to think about the fact that it's not that you went back to what you had, but that you took the layers off. And you opened yourself up to the next piece and then the next piece. And so you have, you may have this journey with the feet that they're the barometer for you, but at least you have a barometer and they're reminding you because people don't react until there's a pain. <laughs> then they yeah. go, no, oh, then pay attention again. So yeah. just to bring that around. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody, nobody embarks upon, you know, a, a grand program of, of, of life renovation, unless there's a motivation for that. Exactly. Um, the thing that's really interesting is once you are out of that acute, oh my God, I can't live like this place, then you can settle into an evolution, which is what you were just describing, is that things, you know, some people call it peeling the onion. I actually don't think that that's really, it's a useful metaphor, but it's a limited metaphor in the sense that we kind of work in, in cycles or spirals. Things come up in a slightly different form. It's not the same. Um, you, 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 try, you try things and they move you forward. And then there's a great aphorism, which is two, two parts that I remember. It was 12, 12 rules for being human. Okay, and number one was you will be issued a body. You may like it, you may not, but it's yours for the duration, which I love. I mean, that's just yeah. great. Yeah. And the other piece of that that I remember is you will be given lessons. You will be given the same lesson until you learn that lesson. And then you're going to get a new one. <laughs> and that's the reward for paying attention and uh, being proactive in your life. Exactly. Yeah. And then it's it's not looking at it that you didn't get anywhere or it's back or um, that didn't work <laughs> because sometimes people say that and it's like, well, it might have worked, but then you added something different to it and brought yourself back again, you know, like, or maybe it, it, it didn't work. And that checks a box that you needed to check in order to kind of hit this from a different perspective. Um, you know, one of the things that I always do with patients is that I'm always going to check their atlas if they are if they come in as a chiropractic patient because that's key. I want to make sure that we have we know that that's not an issue here, okay. or if or if it is, then we address that and then that relieves a load on the system. Okay. So, really, when you work with a human body, one of the things that you're concerned with is what is the burden on this system. It's usually complex. It's usually multifaceted. It accretes more and more with time. Like, you know, the, the pearl is layers and layers and layers. Okay, so we're all beautiful pearls. And sometimes there's a layer that's kind of not really right. And we got to get to that. Um, one of the concepts that I find really helpful in the functional medicine realm is the idea that we develop a progressive burden of unresolved um unresolved infection, unresolved toxicity. The body has not been able to fully process whatever the challenge was. And that is one of the ways to explain chronicity in, as we age. So, so people develop chronic problems because they, 
they've never really addressed anything. Or if they have, they've done it in a way that was either short-term, counterproductive, or not effective. Mm -hmm. Which is yeah. where a lot of the pharma solutions lie because while well, they may be effective in short-circuiting a problem, they're not getting at what caused it in the first place. Right. It may be good enough. It may be good enough for a lifetime. But I'm not crazy about the idea that in less of extreme situations that we are introducing um, a, syn a synthetic chemical element into the human body every day for the rest of their natural lives. Because that everything has consequences. Everything. So where you can, let's try methods in terms of movement, in terms of you know digestive inputs, et cetera, that are much more likely to have positive consequences. Exactly, exactly. One of the things I was thinking about as you were describing all that um, is I've started to say dynamic sitting and dynamic standing because particularly if you're on Zoom a lot, right? And we and you're um, you're sitting and you're listening and you're you're trying to be attentive. You're trying not to be distracting to everybody else who's participating, but you end up sitting, very static. Right. And so I've started dynamically moving all the time so that I'm rotating. If I'm sitting, I'm rotating around on the pelvis so I can feel the sit bone. I can go roll, roll back towards the tailbone and I can keep that moving. And then if I'm standing, then I'm doing that with my feet. And as I was doing uh, two trade shows this weekend, everybody at the end were like, oh, I'm so exhausted. I wasn't. I was really quite energized. Because I had spent the times that I didn't have someone coming to my table, I was moving around all the time on my feet, trying to just be active with them and engaged. And my feet, actually, I was, I took my shoes off and just went in my socks because then I could really feel them. Yeah. And right. so that's what I've started to describe to people, you know, make sure you're being dynamic with them instead of static, where you lock them up and, and hold them in position. Oh. Right. There, there is a school of thought that calls shoes foot coffins, and I think that there is, <laughs> you know, a little justice to that. I will, I will say that. Remember, I mentioned earlier, sensory drives motor. So, mm -hmm. so if one of the things that's really useful about that exercise with the nail brush is that it upregulates the responses of the feet, and that means we get better motor output. We are mm -hmm. sensory driven creatures, you know, from 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 the get go. Um, the other thing is that there's a nice rule uh, rule suggestion, which I call the 20 and two rule, which is for every 20 minutes of inactivity, get up and move for two, which is pretty simple. Go get a glass of water, do a couple of squats. You know, we are not, I'm sitting on a, on a, on a stool that's got a little bit of um, input and it's moving. So, you know, probably look like I'm <laughs> rolling around. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, for those pieces. watching, for uh, listening to the podcast. <laughs> um, but but that livens you up, livens you up, and it that leads me a little bit to the the primal movement realm, which is people who you know some of it's not really appropriate for the mass of us. You know, there are guys that want to walk around on tree trunks carrying rocks. Okay, fine, go ahead, it makes you happy. Fine. But things like working on your hip hinge so that you can get into a deep squat or being able to sit down on the floor and get up without using, you know, a lot of support, like climbing up, using your hands to, to carry you up, but actually coming up from the floor. Um, and there's actually something called the sit rise test, which is an, which is a barometer of mortality and morbidity, which is if you can go down to the floor and sit on the floor unaided by your hands or your knees, just sit down and then come back up. Um, you're likely to live well and long. So in the movement realm, this is no surprise to you, but it's a big surprise to a lot of people. Um, and you can, you can, you can Google it and it, there's a point system for using one hand or one knee, <laughs> whatever, fine. But it's just the idea. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but we didn't used to have all this furniture. You know, the man did not evolve 
we, we develop furniture because it's convenient. And it's nice to be inside a structure that is Oops, I lost from you the elements. But, but, you know, inherently, we're supposed to be able to get up from the ground, so on. But one of the things I think is really useful, although it's fallen into some disfavor, is sitting on a ball. A stability ball is a great mm -hmm. tool for staying active because it keeps it keeps input coming in from from the sit bones yeah. to the floor. And one of the things we haven't talked about, which is, is I could talk about this stuff all day long, as you can tell, <laughs> for the next podcast. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, is the whole concept of the foot as a dome. Yes. We talk about the arch of the foot, and we're always only talking about the inside arch of the foot. There is actually an arch on the outside of the foot, and there's an arch where the toes meet the, the anyway, the, you know, where you flex your toes. That is actually an arch, transverse arch. So the whole thing is basically a cup or a dome, um, ideally. So if that flattens, then things don't, you know, don't work as well. And if you start to look at the human body, it's basically bowls and domes, okay? Dome mm -hmm. of the skull, bowl at the bottom of the skull, top of the lungs are a dome, bot you know, the, the diaphragm at the bottom of the lungs is, is a dome, and then you've got the pelvic bowl. So we have these, these correspondences through the body, and they're all based on sections of circles. There are not any straight lines in the body at all. And that's because curves are dynamic, getting back to your point. They shock absorb well. So if you look at the spine, the back of the head is an outward curve. The cervical spine is an inward curve. Top of the back is an outward curve. Lower, you know, lumbar spine is an inner curve. And then the sacrum is an outward curve. When that jams, going back to the idea about high heels, when that jams forward, it distorts the whole system. And when the head goes forward, shock absorption goes to hell just doesn't work well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, that's really the problem with this. Head uh, forward. Yeah. Head forward, diving into the digital device, be it smartphone, laptop, tablet, monitor, <laughs> desktop monitor. You know, we adapt to the environment around us rather than adapting it to us, which is what we need to do, especially if we're not the very tall and the very short are really disadvantaged. And, and you just have to look at your material environment and figure out how to tweak it so that it works for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because you're more important than the damn monitor. That's for sure. <laughs> and those feet are more important than all the rest put together because when those feet well, are happy. <laughs> Then you can Most start. They're more important than everything else put together, but they are <laughs> they are truly very important. You know, they're they're uh, the base. Yeah. They're happy. That's for sure. Uh, so Margaret, we should probably stop there because I know you and I could keep going because you know we're so passionate about the body <laughs> and how it moves and and the energy and vitality that comes out of it. But I think one of the things that's going to stick with me really is the simplicity of when you think about happiness, how that changes the way the whole body is. And I've talked about it in different ways in my classes, but I never actually succinctly said it the way you did. So thank you for that little nugget. I'd love it. <laughs> well, I don't know what I said, but, you know, the idea that, you know, a healthy body is a happy body and a healthy body is a better functioning body. You know, it's just, it, it, it is, there's no, it's not linear at all. It is all a, a yeah. constellation of factors that help us be the best versions of ourselves that we can and to be of service and uh, to others and, and, and to express love in our lives because that's really what we're here to do. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So on that note, for those people that want to know more about your work and what you do, how can they find you? Well, my practice is called Create Whole Body Health. And um, if you're interested in any of the movement YouTubes that I have done, they, I will warn you, they're all very yakky. I tend to talk, as you can tell, I tend to talk a lot, especially about stuff that I'm interested in. But there's a YouTube channel called it's Create Whole Body Health. Um, there's a website, Create Whole Body Health. Um, I am on Facebook. I have to say that my Facebook and Instagram and LinkedIn presence is pretty much 
uh, neglected and underloved. So I'm going to be working on that in the next several months because really it's not it's not fair to just say I'm not going to do that because that's a means of communication with people. But um, and your website and thing, is is your website dot com. Yeah, createwholebodyhealth.com. Okay, perfect. Great. Always under revision. But and you can always email me. I'm Dr. Winters at create. Okay, the last part faded out. Uh, your microphone <laughs> keeps doing its thing. So sorry about so that. It's Dr. Winters at createwholebodyhealth.com. Perfect. So Dr. Winters. Um, so it doesn't have Dr. Mar <laughs> Dr. Margaret Winters. It's Dr. Winters at, just in case anybody was thinking. Yeah, in there. Um, it's a long enough email as it is. Exactly. So, exactly. So. Beautiful. What a treat oh. to talk to you, Michelle. This has been fun. Yeah, it's been lovely. And um, there's just so many ways that we overlap in what we do and, uh, you know, how we can reach out. And I'm, I'm so glad that you have a YouTube channel that is full of videos for people as resources and that's been my my passion too i have one playlist on my youtube channel just to make sure that people are getting the feet um so there is resource out there for people if they're listening and they want to get started then by all means look up our resources and check us out and the other thing i just wanted to share um it's two pieces because of my Tai Chi background. I have my Tai Chi wellness playlist, which has things on feet, which may be helpful for people. And my and trying to put that into the dance world, I have my bioenergetic wellness dance warm up, and my foot rub is there. So you talked about your foot rub. So I'm excited to dive into the tools that you have and linking them up with the tools that I have and seeing where the two of us actually probably have more synergy happening uh, to be able to bring that forward. So, so at if you're the end, of, end of the day, resources are wonderful and have, you know, more resources, the better. But if you don't do anything else, get up every 20 minutes and bounce around the world because it will make you feel better. And that's a good thing. And so I was just going to ask you, so your advice, because I always try to finish with a movement pattern. So your advice is the 20 and two, get up and move and make sure that you are engaged with what you're doing. And um, I was trying to think about what my recommendation would be. It's always, I, you know, I love foot percussion. Um, but what I really, when I said to you on the weekend that I really just started moving dynamically with my feet and just really engaging them so that I could stand on those lovely cement floors for the whole day. Um, that I think would be my key tool for people this time too, is think about how you're holding statically in positions with your feet and how you might be able to make that a more dynamic kind of experience. And it might be just doing the dishes at the kitchen sink and instead of yeah. standing and leaning, but actually dynamically moving while you're standing there and uh, become more engaged. Yeah. Any, any, anytime joints are locked up, you know, for no particular functional reason, that creates a ripple effect through the health, throughout the whole system. So, you know, lively up yourself is what I would say. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Thank you so much, Margaret. It has been wonderful. A great pleasure, Michelle. Thank you so much for asking me. And, you know, we could, we could go on, but I think we've come to a good stopping. I think so. So as you participate in your physical activities today, choose something that brings you joy, invites your feet to be empowered, and makes you happy. You've been listening to Be Well with Michelle Greenwell. Thank you for commenting, following, and sharing the podcast and helping other people find the resources that we've shared today and in the rest of the series. Have a great day.